The gas station store was empty. Not two minutes earlier, I'd seen a woman behind the counter while I was pumping my gas. Where had she gone? Passing the counter, I glanced down and saw a person's hand on the floor. Changing my angle to peer over the counter, I brought the female cashier into view. She was lying on the floor in a pool of blood, dozens of stab wounds in her chest. Outside, a woman screamed. Fear making my legs heavy, I ran toward the sound. It was Adriana screaming. They were here. I burst through the doors, bringing my expedition into view. A man in black sweats, grimy black work boots, and a demon skull mask was at the side of my Ford. He wore black latex gloves, and he held a machete in his right hand. He looked over as the door chime sounded, his grinning mask sending paralyzing terror through me. He turned back toward the window and brought the machete's handle down on it, shattering the glass as Adriana screamed and scrambled over the center console into the back. I took a step back, telling myself this wasn't my fight. Maybe if I didn't put up any resistance, he wouldn't kill me. Better yet, I could run. I could run out into the night, disappearing into the desert until morning. Taking a step backward, I resolved to do just that. I wanted to live. I didn't want to die violently for some woman I barely even knew. Shaking with fear, I turned to run. I guided the steering wheel to the right, skirting the white line that shone under my SUV's headlights. My left leg bounced as if on its own, my bladder screaming for release. I chugged a big rock star, not to mention the water I'd been sipping on all evening, trying to get rid of the last remnants of my hangover. It was the kind of hangover that could drive a man to quit drinking for good, or at least until the memory of the gut-puckering, tongue-fuzzing, bowel-rumbling experience was a distant memory. But as I pulled into the rest stop, slowing down from 80 miles per hour to 15, I was living the hell that all problem drinkers face. I was right smack in the middle of it, bleary-eyed and hangdogged. And all I could think about was having another drink to take the edge off. Stupid or ingenious, I couldn't tell. Not really, I wasn't thinking straight. I pulled into a space in the rest stop parking lot. Across the way, separated by two low brick buildings that housed the bathrooms, I could see several semis parked in the truck area. Their running lights were on against the dark. But there were only two other cars on my side of the rest stop, an old Trans Am with a black trash bag taped over the clearly broken passenger side window and a listing blue and silver farm truck with rust spots on the body. I wouldn't have been the least bit surprised to find that both the Trans Am and the Chevy truck were no longer running and had been parked at this rest area for days or weeks, abandoned by their feckless owners. I certainly didn't see anyone else around. Not that I was looking hard. As soon as my expedition came to a stop, I slammed the thing into park and jumped out into the clawing desert night hustling to the restroom like I was crossing the finish line in the 400 meter dash. The day's heat hadn't yet dissipated, and I felt sweat sprout up on my skin before I'd even taken four steps. This trend continued when I reached the swampy bathroom, and as I emptied my bladder, I found that I was releasing an almost equal amount of liquid from my body through my sweat glands. This was why I was heading east, out of this spiky, unforgiving desert. One reason, anyway. The other reason had to do with a certain thing I'd done when I was drunk. A certain thing I didn't want to think about. As sweet relief drained my anxiety, I pushed these unpleasant thoughts aside and focused on who I would be when I got to North Carolina. It was time to start fresh. Time to stop drinking. Time to become a responsible adult, for Christ's sake. I was grateful for the lack of a mirror above the bathroom sink. I didn't want to look myself in the eyes, not for a long while, not until I crossed the Mississippi, at least. After washing my hands and using the blow dryer, I headed back outside, got back into my Ford, and fired up the engine. As I pulled out of the spot and started back toward the highway, I glanced to the right and saw a man in a wife beater wearing a black hat and sweatpants running between the two brick buildings. His considerable belly swayed as he huffed and puffed his way toward me. I put my foot on the gas, not in the mood for a conversation with some broke down trucker. Let his trucker pals help him, I thought. And as I eased the speed up, the man waved at me, 
yelling something I couldn't make out over the sound of my engine and the blasting air conditioner. Shaking my head, I turned my attention to the road. Once I was back doing 80, I set the cruise control and took my foot off the gas. The mile markers passed. I rubbed my eyes and yawned. Damn caffeine had already worn off. As I glanced in the rearview mirror, a freezing hand wrapped around my heart. There was someone in the car with me. In the back, I'd just seen them duck their head down as I glanced into the mirror. Nothing more than a dark silhouette, but clearly a person's head. Tensing in my seat, I looked at the glove compartment, thinking about the two screwdrivers I had there. They were the only weapons I had, aside from a rinky-dink pocket knife in my pocket. Knowing I had to pull over, I resolved to do it quickly. I had no choice. I couldn't keep going while someone was sitting back there, plotting to kill me when the time was right. My pulse was thrumming, each heartbeat like a hammer hitting my brain from the inside. I guided the wheel to the right, slamming on the brakes even as my tires went over the rumble strip on the shoulder. Moving as quickly as my recovering body would allow, I put the vehicle in park, got one of the screwdrivers from the glove compartment, removed my keys, and jumped out of the vehicle, almost getting pancaked by a passing semi-truck. After slamming the door and scrambling around to the other side of the car, I stood in the sand among the spiky roadside plants, pointing my screwdriver at my Ford like it was a gun. Get out! I shouted. I know you're in there! Get out! Thanks to the dark and my tinted windows, I couldn't see what was happening in there. Shutting my door was a stupid move. It had turned off the interior lights. I wanted to step up and open the back door, but I was afraid I'd be greeted by a killer clown wielding a giant cleaver or a hulking monstrosity ready to rip me apart with his bare hands. What if he has a gun, I thought, backing up as I gulped down my fear. The back passenger door suddenly opened, the overhead lights coming on inside the expedition. A young woman was backlit as she stepped out of the vehicle, hands up and empty. She wore grimy cut off jean shorts and a baggy sleeveless t-shirt, and she was barefoot. Her thick brown hair was a mess, cut short and styled only by her sweat and the wind. Her arms and legs were dirty, like she'd been living in the desert for days without a tent or a sleeping bag or a morsel of food. Underneath the grime, I saw an attractive young woman, and I was reminded once again why I was leaving the desert in search of greener pastures. What the hell are you doing? I said, still pointing the screwdriver at her. Is there someone else in there? She shook her head, big green eyes peering at me from under bushy eyebrows. I already felt myself cooling, grateful it wasn't some muscle-bound psycho serial killer. Don't be so quick to dismiss her as a threat, a voice inside my head warned. Well, what are you doing? Why'd you get in my Ford? She looked back west, toward the rest area several miles behind us. They're after me, she said in a voice so low I could barely hear her. Who? I asked. The hydraulic hiss of brakes tore my attention away from the hollow-eyed woman. A semi-truck was slowing in the right lane as it approached us, hazards blinking. The woman and I both watched as it pulled onto the shoulder ahead of my Ford. When I looked at the woman, she jumped back into the expedition and shut the door. What the hell is this happy horse? I said to the dry air. The trucker I'd seen at the rest stop ran around the front of the semi and started back toward me, his belly swaying like a pendulum ticking away the seconds until his impending death from heart disease. I moved over toward the SUV as the guy approached. He didn't look happy. What do you want? I shouted when he was close enough to hear. I was still holding the screwdriver out. He saw the tool and slowed, putting his hands up in mock fear. Back it down, man, he said. I ain't a screw, and you ain't never worked a day of construction in your life. What do you want? I said again, backing up as he continued forward. Didn't you see me flagging you down back at the pisser? No, I lied. He stopped just ahead of me, an arm's length away. Bullshit. You looked me right in the pearly whites, goddammit. Fine, I saw you. What's the big deal? Do you know me? Moving as fast as a jungle cat, the trucker stepped forward and slapped the screwdriver out of my hand. Then he jammed his forearm into my throat and slammed me into the side of my Ford, rocking the vehicle on its struts. Suddenly, the woman's comment about someone being after her seemed like the truth instead of crazy talk. I could feel the cartilage in my throat creaking as his forearm cut off my oxygen. 
I saw that skinny little thing slip into your Ford after she ran away from my truck, he said. She took my wallet. That's why I was trying to flag you down, you some To my left, the back door of the SUV opened a few inches and a delicate hand came out, holding a beat up billfold. Don't hurt him, the woman said. He didn't know. The trucker swiped his wallet and then let me go as the woman shut the door. I slid down the side of the SUV, rubbing my throat and breathing in big gulps as I sat. She told me she was a sleeper creeper, the guy said, going through his wallet to make sure everything was there. She's a damn liar. What's a sleeper creeper? I asked from the ground, just to be saying something. I've never been much of a fighter, more of a runner, really. A lot lizard, the guy said. A streetwalker, a prostitute. She told me she was a whore. But when I pulled out my willy wang, she grabbed my wallet and ran. I have a mind to call the police on her. I got up off my ass and brushed off my pants. And tell them you were soliciting a prostitute in a state where prostitution is illegal? The guy glared at me, putting the wallet in a back pocket. I said I have a mind to, not that I'm going to. He paused. Good luck with that one. She's crazy as they come. He turned and headed back to his truck. I searched for the screwdriver for a minute among the tough shrubs and grasses, but I soon gave up. Stepping to the back door, I opened it and looked in at the woman who was sitting on the seat, hugging her legs. Get out. They'll find me, she said. They'll kill me. Who? If it's not that trucker who's after you, who the hell is it? The klepto killers. The name rang a bell. The klepto killers had been all over the news as young women turned up dead along the I-10 corridor. They'd killed something like a dozen women, a family of four, and even a couple of cops who'd pulled them over while they were dumping a body. Apparently, it was two guys, a rarity among serial killers. Really? I said, unbelieving. You were caught by the klepto killers? And you escaped? She nodded. It was all bull Get out! I yelled. Please, my name's Adriana. I'm 23. I've been homeless for six months after leaving my abusive boyfriend. You have to believe me. I'm telling you the truth. The klepto killers won't stop until they find me. That's why they call them kleptos. They once followed a woman who escaped all the way to her parents' house, and they killed them all. Once they choose you, they never let you go. There was a pang of truth in her words. And damn it if I didn't have a soft spot for women, especially those in trouble. Then again, that was how I'd gotten myself into trouble time and again. I sighed. Where do you need to go? Anywhere, far away. Where are you going? North Carolina, I said. I've never been there. I don't have any friends or family there. It's perfect. She managed to smile and it melted what defenses I still had up. Okay, I said, but you gotta help keep me awake. Her smile grew bigger and she showered me with thank yous. She transferred to the front seat while I got in the driver's seat. As I pulled back on the highway, Adriana asked me my name. Joel, I said, pleased to meet you. Are you okay, Joel? Does your throat hurt? I'm good, I said. I let him do that to me. I didn't want to have to hurt the guy. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I regretted them. Why did I always do this around pretty women? It was a curse. But she went along with it, even though anyone who looked at me could tell I wasn't built for fighting. I was rail thin with stooped shoulders and huge feet, but I was tall, which had managed to keep me out of many fights in my life. She reached out and touched my arm. Good, I'm glad you're okay. Wait, Adriana said as I took the exit. It was nearly two in the morning and the nearest headlights were a good mile behind us. What is it? I asked. We can't keep going? She asked. Just a little further? I'm under a quarter tank and I don't know where the next station will be, I said. You're sure no one's following us? She asked. I mean, people follow you on the highway. That's kind of how it works. But I was varying my speed like you said. So I'm pretty sure everyone who was behind us either passed or turned off. She didn't look convinced, but she nodded her acceptance as I turned toward the well-lit gas station. It was fairly empty, but for two cars, one at a pump and one parked in a spot out front. I couldn't see the pumps on the opposite side of the station, 
but I wasn't too worried about it. There was nothing else but empty desert landscape in the immediate vicinity. Just the lone gas station, a beacon of civilization against the beastly night. Don't you need to pee? I asked, lining up my fuel tank with the pump. Yes, she said, but only after you make sure it's safe. Okay, I said, opening the door. I'm gonna pump the gas first, then I'll check around. I paid at the pump and stood there as I filled my tank. Glancing over the top of the SUV into the station, I glimpsed a woman behind the counter. I could only see her head, given the layout of the place, but it was enough to put me at ease. At the next line of pumps, a white-haired man finished pumping and drove away in his sedan. When the pump finally clicked off, I put everything back in its place and headed inside to check the place over for Adriana. As I moved, I glanced at the windows again. I could no longer see the woman behind the counter. Pushing through the gas station doors, I looked around for her. Maybe she's in the bathroom, I thought. But as I moved to the other side of the store, I brought the other set of pumps into view. Sitting at one of the pumps was an old Trans Am with a trash bag over the passenger side window, the same vehicle I'd seen back at the rest stop. Fear swelled inside me, and I turned back to head the other way. Passing the counter, I glanced down and saw a person's hand on the floor. Changing my angle to peer over the counter, I brought the female cashier into view. She was lying on the floor in a pool of blood, dozens of stab wounds in her chest. Outside, Adriana screamed. I burst through the doors, bringing my expedition into view. A man in black sweats, grimy black work boots, and a demon skull mask was at the side of my Ford. He wore black latex gloves, and he held a machete in his right hand. He looked over as the door chime sounded, his grinning mask sending paralyzing terror through me. He turned back toward the window and brought the machete's handle down on it, shattering the glass as Adriana screamed and scrambled over the center console into the back. I took a step back, telling myself this wasn't my fight. Maybe if I didn't put up any resistance, he wouldn't kill me. Better yet, I could run. I could run out into the night, disappearing in the desert until morning. Taking a step backward, I resolved to do just that. I wanted to live. I didn't want to die violently for some woman I barely even knew. Moving toward the back of the station, I had a flash of memory from the night before. A flash of a man beating a woman who screamed and fought on her bed. The bed I'd been sharing with her until her husband showed up. Ex-husband, the woman had told me after we'd met at a bar. We're separated, she'd said when I asked about the pictures hanging up in her hallway. And he won't show up here? I asked drunkenly, not really caring about the answer. I had my hands up under her shirt and she was working on undoing my belt. He better not. I have a restraining order against that bastard. After that, there was no more talk of her husband. He was certainly the last thing on my mind until I heard the front door slam. Before the woman, her name was Trina, could say anything, I jumped off the bed, gathered my clothes, and hid in the closet. I could hear her ex-husband yelling as he came stomping down the hallway. I looked through the cracked closet door as he started in on her with his fists, and I did nothing. I got dressed as the man wailed on her, and I darted out of the closet when his back was turned. He heard me and chased me out of the house, but I had a head start. And when I jumped into my SUV, he yelled that he was going to find me and kill me. I've got your license plate, he said as I took off. You better be looking over your shoulder because I'm coming for you. Somehow, I'd made it back to my extended stay motel room without killing myself or anyone else. I passed out and slept for nearly 12 hours before waking in a panic, packing my few possessions and getting the hell out of Dodge. But now here I was again running away as another woman was attacked by another man. Only this time, there was no doubt of the outcome. Adriana would die. She would be brutally murdered, unless I did something to stop that from happening. Flushed with a sudden resolve and determined to use it before it went away, I spun around to go back into the gas station. I wasn't going to run though. I was going to get something I could use as a weapon. But as soon as I turned around, the door flew open, the chime sounding. I stood in the doorway's path, and it was clear in the split second it took my brain to comprehend what I was seeing, that the man in the zombie scarecrow mask meant to slam me in the face with the gas station door. The door didn't hit me in the face, it bounced off my foot. I mentioned I have big clown feet, didn't I? And hit the other klepto killer as he tried to step out. 
It wasn't much of a hit, but it gave me the moment I needed to react. I turned, slamming the door into the guy with my shoulder, clamping him against the door jamb. He had a big kitchen knife stuffed in his belt, which he managed to reach down and grab with his free left hand. He brought it up, clearly meaning to slice me open with it. I reached up and grabbed his wrist with both hands, still leaning my weight against the door to keep him pinned. He was in an awkward position, his left hand clearly non-dominant. Using both my arms, I yanked his arm down as hard as I could, also shifting my weight enough to bring my left knee up as high as I could. My knee hit his elbow perfectly as I yanked his arm down, folding the appendage the wrong way with the ripping, cracking sound. The knife clattered to the concrete as the man behind the mask screamed out. I reached down and grabbed the knife as the guy tried to pull out of the door. But once again, I kept him in place with my long body, preventing him from getting enough leverage to move the door. I jammed the blade up under his ruined left arm, stabbing him in the side. It was a frenzied stabbing, and I quickly lost count of how many times I plunged the knife into him. When I stopped, there was blood everywhere, and the man had gone limp. So when I stepped away from the door, he collapsed like a house of cards in a windstorm. Knife in hand, I turned back around, seeing that the man in the demon skull mask was no longer at my Ford. The front passenger window was broken, but I couldn't see if Adriana was still inside or not. I had no idea whether she was alive or dead. I ran up to the Ford, glancing inside and seeing that the front seat was empty. As I stepped to the back door to open it, the greatest pain I've ever felt shot up my left leg. I looked down to see Demon Skull's head sticking out from under the SUV, his machete buried in the side of my left leg. Yanking the leg away, I turned to run, but the klepto killer was faster. He pulled the blade back and slashed out at my other leg, severing tendons. I collapsed to my knees, losing the knife in the process. The killer got from under the car as I crawled away, screaming in pain as my blood poured out of the leg wounds. Turn around, the man said, poking me in the back with the tip of the blade. I rolled over and looked up at him. You killed my brother, you piece of sh**, he said, raising the machete for the killing blow. I raised my arms, knowing that he'd simply cut them to pieces to get to my head, but unable to help myself nonetheless. His muscles tensed as he started the first chop, but a hand came out of nowhere, a hand with a screwdriver in it. The flathead screwdriver sunk deep into the side of the klepto killer's head through his ear, causing him to freeze. Adriana, who'd snuck up behind the man, let go of the screwdriver and stepped aside, which brought her into my view. The klepto killer teetered, turning around to look at his assailant. He still had the machete held up, but with his left hand, he reached up and touched the tool sticking out of his ear. He dropped the machete and walked toward the back of the station. He didn't get far before collapsing. I looked up at Adriana, who smiled weakly. She had several minor cuts on her arms, but she seemed okay otherwise. You found my other screwdriver, I said. She nodded. Now I'll find you a first aid kit. She moved quickly past me, kicking the other dead klepto killer as she went through the door to find stuff to bandage me up. I looked out past the lights of the gas station. The heat of the day was finally dissipating. A cool breeze blew across the dark, unforgiving expanse. And for a moment, the desert looked beautiful to me. It looked like the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.